Um, so my name is Carl Fogel. I'm the editor of questioncopyright.org. Um, and I just want to give a very brief introduction. I won't get too much in between you and Rick, just to explain uh, what he's doing here. When we first called Rick and asked him if he'd like to come to America and give some talks on what the Pirate Party is about and what it's doing, we expected to have to twist his arm a little bit. Um, but to our very pleasant surprise, he agreed immediately to come. And uh, I wondered why, because, I mean, he's running for election in, in Europe. And uh, how many Swedish voters really are there in the Bay Area? I don't know. There might be one right there. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's not exactly your, your first choice for getting elected in Sweden. Um, but the reason he came is that the party's mission is worldwide reform of copyright and patent policy. And the party uh, fully understands the, shall we say, concentrating effect that electoral victory in Sweden would have on uh, parliaments throughout Europe and even in the United States. Uh, it would be a very big effect. Which brings me to my next point. Uh, political donations in Sweden are not regulated. And anonymity is the default for donations to the Pirate Party. Uh, when Rick and I were up at OzCon, the O'Reilly Open Source Convention in Portland last week. He gave a keynote, essentially a very compressed version of this talk with a lot of the details left out. <clears throat> People literally came up to the stage and pressed money into his hands after that keynote. I saw it happen. Yeah, did. Um, if you weren't able to be at OzCon, but you would like to do that too, you should feel <laughs> free to do it today. And um, Rick will be giving you some more details and a URL about how you can donate if you don't feel like pressing cash into his bare palms today. Um, the Pirate Party is a very good cause. They're tremendously effective. And if they manage to get into parliament in Sweden or in the European parliament, it will do a lot to help copyright reform in Europe and in the United States. Thank you. And without further ado, Rick Falklinga of the Swedish Pirate Party. Thanks, Carl. So my talk today is titled Copyright Regime versus Civil Liberties. It might as well have been titled Copyright Industry versus the Future. Uh, how many of you, you guys in here have heard of the Pirate Party in Sweden before today? Show of hands. About two thirds. I'm happy. How many of you were at OSCON and heard my talk there? Two. Okay. So you're not. So you're going to see a little bit like you saw at OSCON, but not most of it is new. So, a little bit about who I am and why I'm wearing clothes saying pirate. That might sound a little bit silly. In January of 2006, I set up a web page for a prototype new political party called the Pirate Party, advocating copyright and patent reform. It basically blew up in my face, very, very quickly became a real party, registered with the election authority, went on the ballot. Um, in June of last year, we had a breakthrough to media mainstream awareness. And in September, we had our first election. We got a, a popular voting result of 0.63%. I had hoped for more, but it turns out that that put us in the top 10 results which even was a record for a party founded on election year. <laughs> we are particularly strong among the young voters, which can be seen in our youth section, which is now ranked number four nationally. And they had, have had a 30% growth in just the past six months. So we're seeing a lot of interest in these issues. We're seeing a lot of uptake. We're very much influencing the debate. Whenever there's something about file sharing, it takes about five minutes from, for example, a verdict in an important court case until media calls us. So what is this about then? Why do you found a pirate party? What is the file sharing debate about? Well, the copyright industry likes to talk about economic principles, as in, file sharing hurts our profits. And then somebody comes and says, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. And it becomes sort of a trench warfare discussion <laughs> where it's a lot of he says, she says, he says, she says. And when you have just a lot of conflicting, conflicting reports, 
with opposite conclusions, you kind of lose the audience. The whole thing becomes pretty boring. So what we are saying is that copyright at its heart is a commercial monopoly. When it was created, it was created to distribute books to bookstores by horse and cart. And the key thing there is that if you found an infraction of copyright, you, can find a, you could find a copied book in a bookstore, you could see an unauthorized concert, not paying license money, and the key here is that you found those in public places with the naked eye. Today, however, copyright has crept into my private communications. It is illegal for me to send a piece of music in email to you guys. It is illegal if we're in a chat channel to drop a video clip there. And if copyright is to be enforced in this new environment, then that means all private communications must be monitored for copyright infractions. That means out goes the postal secret. That means law enforcement and corporate interest groups must monitor every one and zero that leaves my computer. And that includes looking at letters to my lawyer and doctor and wife. I'm frankly not prepared to give them that right. And it gets worse. Uh, the copyright industry is now lobbying for ISPs to be liable for what their users do on the net. And there goes another very important principle called the common, common carrier principle, which says that the messenger is never responsible for the contents of the message. Imagine if the US Postal Service would be held liable for what you send in letters. This is what the copyright industry is lobbying for. And they're taking advantage of the fact that politicians are clueless about what new technology means. So our poor lady justice has a problem. On one side of the scale, you have one income source for one entertainment industry, essentially a lux luxury consumption in our society. On the other side of the scale, you have two foundations of our democracy. Hmm. So it actually gets even worse. If you abandon the postal secret and allow corporate interest groups, or for that, that matter, law enforcement, to ex examine private communications, out, go, out goes whistleblower protection. No matter what those people investigating the communications can or cannot do with it, if you uncover a scandal and mail a reporter about it, somebody will have read that mail en route. And if it's juicy enough, there's no, just no way that person can forget what he or she read. It's been read, it cannot be unread, and the whistleblower protection is gone. And by extension, freedom of the press becomes something basically just a piece of oops basically just a piece of paper because if you can't have any sources inside government telling you about things that things that don't work or officials that are misbehaving or trust that is being broken what are you going to write about this week's horoscope It gets even worse, actually. If you know you're being monitored, you tend to put a little bit of self-restraint on yourself. You tend to not say the things that you typically would have said when you know that you're not monitored. And this, wasn't, this actually gets very important, because particularly for some people, I was at the uh, gay pride parade in Stockholm, and I was sort of toying around with this, for me, perfectly logical, rational argument that if you don't have access to private communications, as in unmonitored private communications, then you lose your right to form an identity. Because your identity is formed in a very private exchange between you and friends. And when I threw this argument out at the Pride Park, which is just next to the parade. 
and discuss with people there, I could see it hit them very hard and emotionally. What had been just rational for me well, became an, a, an extremely emotional moment for these people when the penny dropped. You could see them just relive what they had been through as part of, re, re, as part of discovering their identity. Uh, in an unofficial poll later among this crowd, by the way, we got 20%. So these people understand what privacy is about. So the copyright industry would, would like you to believe that it is somehow about right to profits, that the file sharing debate is about percentages, about graphs on a piece of paper. It is not. It is about vital civil liberties that need to be eroded or abolished in order to maintain their old crumbling monopolies. And this is the message that we've started to get out in Sweden. And to paint a picture of this, going back to the history of copyright, once upon a time when the universe was vast, uninhabited, and mostly tax-free. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to fast forward a bit to the Catholic Church in, um, just before the last turn of the millennium, nine, uh, around 900. There was one source of culture and knowledge, and that single source was the church. The communication was top to bottom. You had one source that communicated out to the masses. And this is kind of important because if you can control somebody's culture and knowledge, you don't need to lobby for a single law. You control the world. Time passed. Printing press arrived, late 1400s, spread across Europe. All of a sudden, you had multiple sources of information. And people could start to pick and choose what they actually wanted to listen to. There was still this old model of one tiny source communicating to the masses. But you had multiple sources. This annoyed people. From the 1400s, it took about 80 years for the royal courts to start reacting. And I'm going to focus on the UK from here on, as this is where copyright originated. In 1554, a royal mandate went out that a monopoly should be formed that was called the London Company of Stationers. Their role was to print all the books that authors wanted, except for those which the crown didn't want, which should be burnt instead. So they were essentially a private police force that had the authority and the duty to censor on behalf of the crown. They, also, they were also authorized to burn books printed by an unauthorized printing shop, and they did so on several occasions. So what happened here was that you had instituted a censorship all of a sudden. Across Europe, you also introduced responsible publishers. That is, the people at the top of this pyramid started to be held accountable for what they were printing. So it was sort of OK to not have as much control over the culture and knowledge communicated to the masses, as long as somebody didn't communicate the wrong piece of knowledge and culture in case nasty things happened. Another couple of years passed. The uh, parliament in UK basically said to the London, Com London Company of Stationers, which had now been a uh, censoring private poli for police force, with all the huge popularity that went along with that task, 
that, okay, guys, we've changed our minds. We now believe in freedom of the press. Sorry, your, your monopoly is about to expire, which these guys didn't like very much. So what they did when being told that authors are now going to be in control of their works was to sort of think about, OK, how can we maintain our monopoly? How can we like, pretend to give the power to the authors but still keep it? So what they did was to go to parliament and argue that, OK, if uh, we're OK with authors getting this right, but we, we think they should have a monopoly on printing these books, on printing their work, and that should be pretty much like property. And hence, the term intellectual property was coined. And if it's property, then that means it can be bought and sold, like to us. So we can buy this monopoly to authors which, well, I don't know, maybe need us to print their books. So the key here is that, and this is what happened, and this might have been a very rational and perhaps even the correct response for parliament to pass in 1709, which took effect in 1710. But it's interesting to see that the, the exact same argument is being proposed today for this. Things have kind of changed in 300 years. So the key here is that copyright, while written into law that it's supposed to be for the benefit of the author, never was. It was for the benefit of the distributors. It was created, it was lobbied by the old monopoly as a way for that monopoly to remain, even after the authors had supposedly gotten it instead. And it's, it's interesting also that this was a, originally a time-limited monopoly, 14 years, extendable for another 14 to, 20, to 28. It's notable that the, this sta London Company of Stationers actually claimed that even after these works had expired into the public domain. They still own the property. They still own the monopoly. Some things just never do change, do they? Whereas today, the situation is a nice, yummy bowl of pasta with pesto on top. No, sorry. The, today, everybody is talking to one another in a completely organic fashion in a completely unstructured fashion. And this is the key thing, with no more central point of control. There is no longer anybody to hold accountable if the wrong piece of culture or knowledge should happen to spread. You might find one leak. You might pretend that there's still this top-down communication but when everybody's talking to one another, that's trying to shoehorn an old model into a new reality. So that's my brief talk of where we came to be. So I'm going to skip past all of this, how it came into the US, because it's really not relevant. It hasn't changed that much since the statute of Anne and distributors lobbying parliament now Congress, for better monopolies. What we're saying is that, OK, there might be some business models that require a time limit of monopoly. Like I can imagine a $200 zillion movie out of Hollywood might want some sort of time limited monopoly in order to get all of that venture capital. But that monopoly must really not stretch into my private communication. I'm sorry, but the box stops there. So we're saying that we're returning copyright to its commercial origins. We're also saying that a, a time span of 
the life of the author plus 70 years is not reasonable. And most of all, we're saying that non-commercial usage must be let free. We're saying that non-commercial collection, usage, derivation, and spread of knowledge and culture must be let free in order to really take advantage of and harness the information society we are now entering. We have as vision a society where every citizen has 24 by access, 24 by 7 access to all of humanity's collective knowledge and culture anywhere. That is a huge leap forward. This is not, it is not a bad thing that the copyright industry has to take a step back. This is a much larger leap ahead than when public libraries arrived about 150 years ago. And it is now enabled by today's technology. Like I said, the copyright industry is fighting tooth and nail to not have to change. But technology has always changed society. In Stockholm, where I come from, which is the capital of Sweden, the largest employer in the entire city 100 years ago was named Stockholm Ice. They cut up the, the ice on the lakes in wintertime, stored them in huge, huge, huge barns, cut them up and distributed them to ice boxes during the rest of the year to households. They don't really add much value today. With the advent of electricity and the electric refrigerator, they're gone. And new, new jobs have come to take their place. That's the way it's always been. And I think it's a safe bet that that's, what they, that's the way it'll always be. So with this, we're seeing a lot, a lot of interesting new business models. And I'm sort of doing the comparison with the dating service here. Just because a, an exchange is non-commercial doesn't mean that the exchange can't be commercially facilitated. Like if I were to date somebody in here, that would be non-commercial. Even if I had subscribed to a dating service and he or she had subscribed to a dating service on commercial grounds, the date itself would still be non-commercial as opposed to paying for a date and associated activities, which is usually not, which is commercial and not always encouraged. <laughs> so I can see lots of new business opportunities coming along in just a few years with copyright reform. And I mean, I'm at Google, so I'm not going to tell you. And here's the sad part. Politicians genuinely do not understand this. They are too preoccupied with their health care, with their defense, with their energy policy, schools, and so on and so forth. Heck, they've just woken up to something known as the environment. So we sort of thought that the only way would be to do something else. And another problem is that the copyright industry understands this perfectly. You think they're clueless, and they look clueless. They are very good at looking clueless. But when you look at what they lobby for, it turns out that they're quite the opposite. And I'm going to give you two examples. First, the, um, in Brussels, which is the European equivalent of Washington, DC, they were recently lobbying for amendments to a bill that would give four years in prison just for accepting file sharing. This was thought to be aimed at the ISP level. And four years in prison, that is a magical limit in Europe, which would have given them unlimited access to warrantless wiretapping in most states of Europe. 
like I said, there goes the postal secret. They understand this. They're also, I'm going to give you another anecdote from a Copyright Industry Insiders seminar that I attended in Stockholm. They sent out an open invitation, so a lot of pirates came there in suit and tie and everything. Like my vice chairman says, if you can't convince them, at least confuse them. <laughs> And the Danish head honcho went up on stage and said that, you know, guys, politicians really don't understand file sharing. We're in perfect agreement so far. <laughs> so he said, what we need to do is to filter the internet. But since politicians don't understand file sharing, we need to associate file sharing with child pornography. Because politicians understand child pornography. And this is how unscrupulous and cynical these people are. This was on May 29. You may recall that at the beginning of June, the Pirate Bay was nearly shut down because of vague allegations about child pornography that never, ever, never, ever manifested and was drawn back in a flurry of outrage. Might have been a coincidence, but like Douglas Adams wrote, that coincidences can be dangerous things. So our solution was to bypass the politicians. Since they didn't care, we headed straight for the voters and challenged the original politicians on election day at the polls. And frankly, I think we did pretty well. Our platform summed up briefly. Like I said, non-commercial use must be let free. Copyright has no place in my private mail, in my private ones and zeros. Commercial, commercial copyright term should be shortened quite drastically. We propose a five-year term from publication, thus just putting a stake in the ground, though it might be three years, it might be seven, it might be 10, it might be slightly different depending on different causes. We're just saying that it needs to be shortened. 70 years after the lifetime of the author is, from my personal perspective, infinite since I will not be alive to see any work that is created during my lifetime enter the public domain. Attribution is good. We really like attribution. It is the, key, it is the reason for many, many, many artists to create works in the first place. DRM is evil. We base we're basically saying that DRM is corporations writing and arbitrarily enforcing their own copyright laws. We have a parliament to write such laws, thank you very much. Patents are evil. They range from totally useless to immoral to more or less diabolical. <laughs> Privacy is good, due process is good, and transparent government is even better. And this is the whole of our platform. We do not take a stand on things where we do not add value to the debate. We want to add things to the debate and bring things into parliament that the current crop of politicians do not understand. And this is actually a strength and not a weakness, I'm, and I'm going to tell you why in a little while. What's important about this is that every single business model based on copyright that makes money today will make money with these changes implemented. The only difference is that millions of people will not be criminals. Patents, however, since we're advocating the complete abolition of patents, a couple of people might have a problem, but I don't think they'll be too much missed. So what we've done so far is that we've, after the election, we've started to influence the other parties in Sweden. People, parties are now coming to us and asking, um, guys, I'm sorry, but we, 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 either, we really don't understand this issue. Do you think maybe if you, we buy you lunch, you could explain it to us? <laughs> of course we do. I mean, we wanted this the whole time. Now you tell us. Why didn't you tell us a year ago and we wouldn't have to go through all this trouble? So anyway, yeah, we're starting to influence the other parties. The Norwegian party 
a Norwegian Liberal Party even went as too far as to copy our entire stance of platform, stance on copyright, top to bottom. They just translated it and adopted it unanimously. <laughs> that's, that's how ID should spread. They forked our platform into Norwegian. <laughs> yeah, actually. Uh, actually, they did this uh, one week after April 1st, and that was such bad timing. I would have loved to, for them to do it one week before April Fool, so we could issue a press release on April 1st saying that we would sue them for copyright infringements over this. <laughs> bad timing. Anyway. And I mean, the youth sections of the other parties are totally on our side. We usually joke that we don't have one youth section. We have eight. <laughs> We've built an organization. On election day last year, we had 2,000 volunteers covering 93% of the polling stations nationwide. I'm extremely happy with that number. And remember now that this was all done on a volunteer basis. They didn't just chip in their own time and, mon time and energy. They also chipped in their own money. When we said that, OK, guys, go, go and hand out flyers on the street here. And they said, OK, so who go who's going to pay for printing? And we said, you are. Here's the PDF. <laughs> and it, it happened. And we had a record first election. And to give you two more numbers, my personal candidacy for Swedish parliament came in at rank 15 out of over 5,700 candidates across all parties. Now, I didn't, get, I didn't win that seat because the party didn't get, get enough votes. We didn't cross that threshold of, at 4%. But it tells you something about how strongly people do feel about these issues. Another number is that in the school mock elections, which are held parallel to the real elections, we got 4.5%. And what's notable about that is that we were not on the school ballot. So those were all right-in votes. <laughs> so we are very, very strong among people who understand this, which are usually the very young people. If you look at our membership roster, we peak in the college ages. So coming back to why we have a narrow platform, how can a 4% party have any influence? When you have 15 people in a chamber of 349 with a pirate cap on their head going har, 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 har in every debate, <laughs> how can you contain yourself? Well, <laughs> there's actually a plan behind this. In Sweden, there are always there are two blocks of parties, the socialist and the bourgeois bloc that are always very tied in elections. It's the, the elections go one way or the other just by 1% or less usually. And imagine now that a 4% party would come in as a wedge between these two. That means both of them would need us in order to form a majority coalition. That means we get to sit down and play who wants to be a prime minister. <laughs> And the price of that office will be an intellectual property reform. <laughs> That's also why we don't have a stance on everything else, because that lets us vote with that block on everything else without giving anything up. So we're basically saying that, OK, guys, here's our platform. Adopt this, and we'll accept whatever you have. And remember now, we're only saying that our stance is more important than the difference between these two blocks. One wants 78% unemployment benefit, one wants 80. Who cares? <laughs> That's when our message, and it's actually quite strong, I think. And why Sweden, then? The numbers you see up on screen is global production. The total global production yearly is $60 trillion. Out of those, the US account for 12. The European Union account for exactly as much. It just differs by a fraction of a percent. And China account for, accounts for, for 10. 
This is important, important as it means that the US copyright lobby cannot threaten trade sanctions against Europe like they would be able to do with, for example, Burkina Faso, which is economically weaker than the US by much. <laughs> and another reason is that in Europe, the copyright laws are actually at the state level. They are not at the federal level, which means that Sweden is at liberty to change its copyright laws. While, get, while all the time enjoying the shield from trade sanctions that Europe gives. So I'm going to argue that the best and easiest way to get around an intellectual property reform in the US is to take the scenic route through Europe. Because once one or a couple of countries changes their stance, then, I mean, the whole system will need to change dramatically and pretty much immediately. So we have two elections coming up. The first is the European election in 2009, about two years from today. And to give you a picture of our chances there, I told you that we had, no, I didn't tell you, we had 35K votes in the last national election. We're gonna get another 35K from the school election, people who come of voting age. That gives us 70K votes. We need 100K votes to put people into European Parliament. That means we need to grow by 50%, counting from September of last year. And remember that graph in the start now. Our youth section has grown by 30% in just the past six months. The numbers very clearly suggest that we can do this. We can really do this. And then comes the national election in 2010, which would let us pray, play this who wants to be a prime minister game. <coughs> and to round this off, like Carl mentioned previously, campaign elections mean election campaigns mean election campaign funding. Uh, donations to political parties in Sweden are not regulated. Anybody's free to donate anonymously if desired. We treat all, an, all donations as anonymous by default and we will not confirm nor deny any particular contributor. If you're interested in donating, there is a folder, looks like this, placed at the table at the end here and around the corner. It contains the, a summary of what I've said in this keynote as well as, as some more information. It's called the Contributor's Brief. And the same information is available at this URL, www.piratpartiet.se. Piratpartiet is Pirate Party in Swedish, pretty much the same words. Slash donate. So that's it. Let's go change the world. So, questions? Yep, hands are coming up. Without patents, how will pharmaceuticals be able to fund research? Thank you for letting me talk about this. <laughs> so the question was, without patents, how will pharmaceutical companies be able to fund research? This, like you noticed, this was mostly focused on copyright. I could talk equally long and as long again about patents. But to cut it fairly short, 80% of the pharma company revenue comes from public funding. Pharma companies claim that they spend a lot of money on research and development. Only when, when you look at their own annual reports, and I've looked at the top 20 of them, they spend on average 15% on research and development. Out of these 15%, two-thirds are spent circumventing other pharma pat companies' patents. That, come, that number comes from the FDA. 
In the annual, annual reports, you can also see that about 30% of their revenue is spent actually manufacturing the medicines. That means we have 45% covered. The rest is profit and uh, marketing. So this means that you have public funding of 80% but only 45% can be accounted for as doing some real social good to the public. So if you were to instead take the manufacturing and put it out to the lowest bidder, just on contract, and use public grants for these 15%, and you can even increase it within the existing budget, you'd get less public spending you would get more money to pharma research, and well, you'd lose the profit and uh, marketing uh, costs of the pharma companies, which are essentially the costs of having a very institutionalized monopoly. Did that make sense? OK, nodding. Good. won't patents enable new and, in, new and innovative companies. That is the usual claim. However, we've gone through all the claims of the benefits of patents, and we've found every single one of them to be false. Patents are usually claimed to be a protection for the lone inventor against predatory large corporations. However, even the patent office chief of Sweden claims that this is not true the patent system does not give that protection. This is why I say that patents range from useless when big companies have these huge patent portfolios and just sign cross-licensing agreements to immoral when third world countries are prohibited by the industrialized world to manufacture medicine for their own population to, um, to diabolical like software patents. Go ahead. Thanks. Sorry. Um, the, as far as I'm aware, Google has never. You might want to use the microphone, Carl. Uh, There's one there. Uh, as the questioner mentioned that Google supported itself off intellectual property. As far as I'm aware, Google has never initiated an offensive software or even hardware patent suit against anyone. There might have been some back channel threat. I refer to defensive. Patents. The, owns the original, uh, you know. Everybody's got to file defensive patents because it's a jungle out there. But uh, but that doesn't mean that they're supporting your business. No, I just okay, yeah. So if there were no patent system, you wouldn't have to file defensive patents. I guess is what I'm saying. So. Uh, there was another question in that area somewhere before. Um, was it you? Okay. And I see you down there. Yeah, so uh, before I came to this talk, I was wondering, you know, if you've been a content creator and, uh, you know, that would put you in much more substantial position to talk about copyright. But, you know, after I, I listened to your talk, I realized, well, first of all, copyright is for um, protecting the distributors. Mm -hmm. So I'm an independent, well, I kind of play music, you know, it's my hobby. And I've looked at, um, possibility of creating my own internet radio station. Right. And I realized that um, ever since uh, SoundExchange imposed the uh, copyright royalty on it, uh, I realized that it's actually mandatory for me to actually pay them in order to play my own music, you know, <laughs> that is nobody else's business, right? So, you know... Sorry for laughing, I just... I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's, that's the truth. I have to pay them just to play my own music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just want to make this comment, you know, you know, just to illustrate how copyright is so broken. Right. And you what know. I usually... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and what I usually say when I get this question, well, how will the artist get paid? If I had a dime for every time I had that question. <laughs> I mean, file sharing hurts the distributors. I hope it does. I really hope it does. <laughs> and, and, but the thing is, it actually enables artists to get paid. 
because all this money does, now anymore, does not anymore go to useless distributors that are not really needed, but can instead go to the artist. If you just see distribution of uh, media as marketing for your real revenue source, like concerts. I mean, even in the age of records, rec the sale of records weren't really a good source of income for the artists, but concerts were. So I see file sharing as actually not hurting, but enabling musicians to have an income. Yeah. So what if I make a video extolling the virtues of dogs, which I really love, and I hate cats, but somebody on YouTube like remakes it my video, mm -hmm. is their video about cats, and brings it to show that dogs suck. Do I, I mean, have I sacrificed, even though I've created this wonderful video about the dogs I love, have I sacrificed that for their use in evil cat <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I mean, I, I, to be honest, I am not. Sh I don't hear you entirely from down there. Could you please use the microphone? I think he's talking about moral rights. Oh, okay. So if I make something and then someone uses it for a purpose that I really would rather not, you know, like maybe George right. Bush takes my video and puts it in his campaign. I mean, right. What what rights do I have, if any? Right. So we are saying that any derivative work should be given new protection. And this, is some, this leads to some interesting, interesting effects that actually do change moral rights. Not business model, but moral rights. And I'm going to give you one solid example. In the 60s, there were a lot of classical works that were give, being remade as rock tunes. And all of the old school artists cried out foul that this was horrible and they should be stamped with a skull and never e ever gone on public radio, whereas the entire younger generation thought that this was the best thing since sliced bread. So it was a great new culture, even though the original artist hated it and its guts, it was actually a new culture that contributed to, to uh, the common pool. So I, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that Everybody is creating culture out of, from previous pieces in the common pool. That means that you should not have the right to prevent somebody from using your piece to create new culture again. There are exceptions where, like I said, any derivative work is a new work. That's not entirely true. Then there are a few exceptions like translation of, of books, like subtitling of movies, where it's really the same work. But I'm going into details now, and I won't take your time with this. OK? I'll see you down there. Oh, the, oh, uh, OK. No, you just go ahead. Do you think uh, there are also initiatives that can be done in other countries, um, especially South America? Or Excellent Brazil? question. Excellent question. Uh, the pirate movement, we, s oh, actually, you've seen it. This is the Ubuntu screensaver. We, it's not part of my talk. Uh, we're someti sometimes joking that we were born on Slashdot. This movement, the emotions of this movement is present all across the world. There are fledgling pirate parties in many, many countries. Although, as, as far as I know, Sweden is the only pirate party to have broken through to mainstream awareness outside the geek community and has had some reasonable success in an election. There are pirate parties on six continents out of seven. There isn't one on Antarctica. So what can people in other countries do, particularly in Latin America? Well, Latin America has a very strong interest in these issues. They have a very strong interest in intellectual property reduction. Unfortunately, they lack the economic clout to put a real, put a real dent, dent in uh, the US copyright lobby. The, Europe, however, has that clout because of the equal economic strengths. 
So what we are hoping for and believing very strongly in is that when we get our first real political success, as in putting people into the European Parliament, that that'll inspire, first of all, inspire pirates across the world to build organizations and fast, and B, scare the bejesus out of politicians who all of a sudden realize that they're about to lose their jobs if they don't understand this issue and fast, which is gonna be helpful. So yes, this is present all over the world. And the, from what we see in support, it's particularly strong in Europe and, like you say, Latin America. Yes, there was a question down there. Uh, I have a tiny question, um, and it might be somewhat uh, ironic. So um, you must be familiar with the GPL, the mm -hmm. GNU license. Yep. The way I understand it, so I'm not a lawyer, but the way I understand it is that it's actually protected by copyright. Yes. So if you take copyright away, you know, someone could take let's say GNU Emacs or something like that, make some extension and just chip the binary. You won't be able to edit the source anymore. So the, so the main, uh, you know, the core foundation of, of free software goes away. Does that right. make sense? Th so that is, this is true. What's the fix? This is true, and I have two, f two answers to this. One of the, one of the best so answers is actually in a signature on uh, the Pirate Party's forum. It says that, so on one hand, I re get one restricted, 24 by 7 access to all of, humanity's, humani all of humanity's knowledge and culture. And the price I pay for that is that after five years, somebody can take my source code and do whatever they want with it. And that is an easy choice. The other answer I have is that it could still be seen as somewhat skewing the system towards favoring proprietary software. And what we are doing is that we basically are, pr we pretty much like open source and free software. In fact, we like it a lot. So what we're saying in, is instead that the public sector, which has this like huge pile of money, whenever it makes purchasing decisions, it may, must actively counteract the formation or continuations of monopolies on information or formats. Essentially, that means not only favoring open source, but actively working against proprietary software. So that is, that is my answer. Is it good, good enough? Nodding and, nodding and smiling. Thank you. When Carl? You say the public center, you mean the, like the Swedish government? The exactly. I mean the Swedish government. I mean the Swedish government's money. I see we've, we've hit the full hour here. And there are, okay. What's your position on trademark? Should I be able to make a browser and call it Mozilla Firefox 4? Thanks. Uh, this is actually good that you brought that up. And originally, we didn't know quite where to stand on trademarks, but we figured that they are a completely different animal than uh, copyrights and patents because copyrights and patents are only for the benefit of the mon monopoly holder, whereas trademarks are intended to be for the benefit of the consumer. It's intended to be a fraud protection on a market where it's the seller and buyer are not personally acquainted as in, and is intended to reduce transactional costs. While the benefit can be debated, as in, well, if I try to sell a Sony video, and I'm obviously not Sony, that's a trademark infringement, yes, but it's also fraud. So would fraud law be enough? Maybe, maybe not. But we're at, we're at least not seeing the immense harm from trademarks that we are seeing from copyrights and patents. So we decided that this is not, this is not an important fight. Let's, let's put our, all our wood behind the arrows that count. Okay, no more questions. Then I thank you, thank you very much for having me here, Togo.